Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, 25 to 40. Acts chapter 16, 25 to 40. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they, so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officer, saying, Let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have said to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Amen. May the Lord be blessed by the reading and hearing of his word this morning. Please be seated. Our title this morning is Committed to Preach. This is part two. We talked about the first part of this story last week. And so today we're going to finish up uh, this portion of Acts here in uh, chapter 16. Committed to Preach, part two. And as I mentioned last week, the reason we have a picture of a man jumping uh, from cliff to cliff is that is commitment. Okay? Uh, once your feet leave the ground, you're committed to making that jump. And when you are going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, going to proclaim it, there needs to be full commitment. Because if you hesitate, you're going to get hurt. Right? That is what this guy would have ha gotten had he hesitated in his leap. And so we need to be committed. We want to begin this morning with prayer. Father, we believe that there are no accidents. We believe that the people who are here this morning are here by divine appointment. We believe that this passage of Scripture being preached today is by your direction. We believe that you have orchestrated all of these events and put us together because you have something planned for us this morning. And so I ask that I would not get in your way. <laughs> that you would communicate the truth of your word to your people through your instrument, myself. And I pray for each one of us here that our hearts would be open, that, Lord, you would remove anything that is hindering our relationship with you, that we would make right anything that is preventing us from hearing your truth, and that your word would speak to our hearts, that we would have hearts of flesh and not stone. And that, Lord, we would leave here transformed because of your word. We thank you, we praise you, we anticipate what you are going to do this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Imagine with me that you are walking with someone and they are looking at their phone. Now that's not too hard to imagine because this happens all the time now. So you're walking with someone, they're looking at their phone and you're, you're, you see that up ahead is a cliff. Right? They're walking with this person, they're looking at their phone and they're headed right off the cliff. Now, you're a little bit behind them. You're not close enough to grab them to physically prevent them from going off the cliff. What do you do? How do you prevent them from walking off the cliff? You yell, right? You shout. You say, hey, stop. Because if you don't, they're going to die, right? See, every single day, people are headed into an eternity without Christ. And if we do not speak, if we do not warn them, 
they die. Jude talks about having compassion on some and grabbing hold of others to pull them from the fire. We need to be serious about bringing people to Jesus. And that means that we open our mouths, we speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling men and women back from the edge. We need to pull them out of the fire. And our passage this morning is talking about speaking the gospel. Last week we saw that the need to be confident in our God if we're going to be committed to preach, right? That we're, if we're going to be committed, we need to be confident in His placement, that He has us where He does for a reason. We need to be confident in His purpose, that He has a plan and a purpose for us being there, and we need to be confident in His power to accomplish that task. Today we learn that commitment to preach means we are ready to speak, at every opportunity. Because we can believe everything we want about God, but if we never open our mouths and say something, people aren't going to get saved. Because that is how God has ordained that people come to Christ, through the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel message. Now remember that when when we're talking about preaching, we're not necessarily meaning what I'm doing up here this morning. We're talking about that word preach literally means proclaim. Okay? So it's proclaiming, it's speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is something that all of us are doing, right? or are supposed to be doing. Okay? So it's, we're speaking, proclaiming the gospel. Unwillingness to verbally proclaim Christ demonstrates a lack of commitment. Okay? We need to be ready to speak, but please don't speak unless you know what to say. Right? Um, sometimes we think, well, I would speak, but I don't have anything to say. Well, We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, right? That all of us have something to share. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a testimony, and you can share that, okay? So you have something to share. This passage gives us three areas in which we must be ready to speak. There's three kind of situations in this passage where Paul and Silas speak, and we're going to talk about those this morning. When we speak of our God, lives are transformed. We've got to take this really seriously. Change occurs. Things happen when we speak of our God. And so area number one, we must be ready to speak God's praise. Number one, we must be ready to speak God's praise. When should we praise God? When should we praise God? Unceasingly. Amen. Unceasingly. We, when I had gotten just out of high school, um, my older brother Tim had something that he really wanted to do. He wanted to um, make a music album, right? Um, we, or my family's very musical, and so he really wanted to make a, a, a CD. And so he saved up thousands of dollars, right? And me and him and one of our other friends, we got together, we wrote some songs and things like that, and uh, we spent several months in a recording studio recording an album, right? And so there it is. Uh, don't get too excited. It's not that great, right? Uh, it's 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 really, um, it was a long time ago. Anyway, uh, however, there's a few songs that have stuck with me over the years, okay? And one of them is called All the Time, and the chorus goes like this. Don't just praise the sovereign God above when all things go your way. Praise him for the darkest night along with brightest day. The loving Father has a plan for pleasure and for pain. So praise him all the time in the sunshine and the rain. That has just stuck with me through these years, Because this is the praise that we are to offer God. All the time praise. Unceasing praise. Praise of God regardless of trial, regardless of suffering, regardless of persecution. When we speak God's praise in the midst of darkness, in the middle of difficult circumstances, we're going to discover two things. First, we discover that praising God brings freedom. Praising God brings freedom. Look at verses 25 and 26. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Now we saw last week that they have been stripped, they've been excessively beaten, and they've been put into the stocks. They have uh, been humiliated, they're in pain, they're suffering, and they respond to this persecution with prayer and singing. These actions are only possible if we understand the sovereignty of God. Why do I say that? Because you have to believe that God has a purpose and a plan 
for you being in prison in order to sing his praises while you are there. Prayer is always an act of submission. It is a recognition that God's power replaces our insufficiency. Paul and Silas could do nothing to change their circumstances, so what do they do? They appeal to the only one who can. Right? And so if you are overwhelmed, if you are burdened, if you are imprisoned and chained, pray. Pray. Two kind of classic passages on prayer in Scripture, there's lots of them, but these are two that, that always come to my mind. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. You know, we can tell each other our burdens, and, and we need to, and that's good, but to be honest, you know that there's going to be times where the person you tell probably doesn't care, right? I mean, hopefully they do. Hopefully, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we care about each other's burdens. But if they don't, we have someone who always cares. Casting all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Cast your burdens on the one who cares. Don't be anxious. Give it to Jesus. When we unburden ourselves, we are then able to praise our God. <laughs> I want you to notice an important grammatical note. Is the word hymns singular or plural? It's plural, which means more than one. So here, here's what I'm getting at. They're in prison, they've been beaten, they've been stripped, they're put in the stocks, and they pray and sing multiple songs of praise to God. Not just one song, multiple songs of praise to God. Their praise of God did not result in immediate release. They kept singing. Release is not why they were singing. See, Paul and Silas are not praying because they're expecting to be released. They're not sitting there going, if we, if we just sing one more song, then God's going to open the doors, right? No. They're singing and praising God because of who He is, not because of what they're wanting Him to do. They are confident that He is sovereign in the midst of their circumstances, and so they're praising Him for that. There's no expectation of release. They're casting their burdens on Christ, and they are so liberated that they burst forth into song. This is what happens when we give everything to the Lord in prayer. We are set free spiritually. There are times when I am uh, uh, having a time of prayer with the Lord and you're giving things to Him and then you, I just sing. Now, I could be because I'm weird, but it's also because you just want to praise the Lord, right? You want to praise the Lord. The spiritual freedom of Paul and Silas does not depend on their physical freedom. See, sometimes we think, well, I would praise God if my circumstances were different. Oh, folks, if we can't praise God in the midst of difficult circumstances, we're not going to praise Him when things are going well. Our spiritual freedom does not depend on our physical freedom. The last line in verse 25 is very significant. Last line in verse 25 says this, and the prisoners were listening to them. I just want to remind us all of something. It's very important, beloved. We are being watched. We are being watched. I mean, you think, here's these guys, they're in, the, they're in the inner part of the prison, but they're being watched still by the other prisoners. My family, uh, extended family, has experienced some tragedy. Uh, several years ago, my oldest brother and his family uh, had their baby die in the womb just a couple weeks before birth. And then my other older brother and his family had their three-month-old little girl pass away and go home to be with Jesus. But one of the things that was so incredible in the midst of that heartache was going to those funeral services and seeing them packed with people who didn't know Christ because of the influence of these families. And you know what those people came for? Because they were watching and they wanted to see, is your faith real? Do you still believe in God when nothing is going right? Do you still believe in God when a little one gets called home? When we go through trials, an unsaved world 
watches to see if our faith is real. They're, they are watching you and me and they want to know, do we have a faith that is going to endure the test? Matthew 5.16 says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Paul and Silas show us how to endure trials. We endure trials with praise. And when we praise God in the middle of suffering, amazing things happen. Now, I'm not going to say that, uh, that the same amazing things are always going to happen because in this instance, an earthquake happens. All right, look at verse 26. Verse 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Now, I think it is safe to say that this is not a normal result of an earthquake. Every time that there is an earthquake, prisoners don't get set free, okay? Uh, that's, that's not what normally happens with an earthquake. So what am I saying? I'm saying this is a supernatural event, okay? This is a supernatural event. It's a very localized, specific earthquake for a specific reason. And I believe that God wants everyone in this city to know that when you serve Him and you praise Him in trials, He delivers, and I want to be clear, the deliverance being spoken of here is literal, it's physical. They, the doors of their cells literally opened, their chains literally fell off. It was a literal, physical, bodily deliverance. That being said, I want to make a non-physical application. Again, this is application, okay? There are chains that can bind us that are not made of metal. You may be here this morning and you're bound in chains of bitterness, bound in chains of unforgiveness, of unfulfilled expectations. You've been hurt. You have suffered. Life has not worked out the way that you wanted. Beloved, you can be free of those chains. See, freedom is found in Christ. We pray, we sing praises, we let go of that bitterness, we forgive, we trust in a loving Heavenly Father. You do not have to live in bondage to those things. See, we serve a chain-breaking God. Turn to Him. Break the chains. When we praise God, there is freedom. There is freedom. Now remember, Paul and Silas experienced spiritual and emotional freedom before physical freedom. We can have peace and joy in the middle of a trial as long as our focus is on Christ. True freedom is internal. True freedom is internal. Submission to the Lord of all brings true freedom. Submission to the Lord of all brings true freedom. So that's what we see here first, that praising God brings freedom. Secondly, we discover that praising God brings compassion. Look at verses 27 and 28. Verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Now, why does this jailer respond this way? Uh, something that we have to understand is there was a rule, a law at this time that said, if, uh, if you were a jailer and a prisoner escaped on your watch, you had to take their place. So whatever their penalty would have been, that now becomes yours. Okay? So this guy thinks, I'm better off dead. That there's no way that this is going to turn out well for me. I am just going to kill myself. Now, there's a minor lesson here on assumptions. Uh, get facts. Don't just jump to conclusions. Because he didn't check the cells. He didn't try to get any information. So don't jump to conclusions. Get information. All right? But what we saw in the previous verse is that Paul and Silas have changed their focus. They took their eyes off of themselves and they fixed their focus on Christ. And so they see this as a gospel opportunity. What do I mean? Here's the jailer. And I want you to think about this for a second. So the magistrates had them stripped and beaten. And then they took Paul and Silas and they delivered them to this jailer and it was his decision to place them in stocks in the middle of the prison. Okay? So it was his decision to do that. It wasn't the magistrates. They didn't legislate that. He made that choice. So this is the guy that put them in the stocks. I don't know about you, but I think my flesh says, let him fall on his sword, right? Problem solved, Right? Do you think there might have been that temptation for Paul and Silas? Just let him die. 
Instead, Paul calls out and he stops him from killing himself. There's another thing here. All the doors are open. Why didn't they leave? Because they know God is doing something. God doesn't just pop cell doors open for no reason, right? God has a purpose. He has a plan here, and they want to be a part of it. Paul he is moved with godly compassion and he calls out, how many of us would see unlawful punishment and imprisonment as a gospel opportunity? You see, when our eyes are full of self, we're blind to what God is doing. God is doing things all around us, but sometimes all we can see is our own thoughts, our own desires, our own wants. If we want to see the opportunities around us, we have to be like Paul and Silas. We have to stop thinking about ourselves. We have to look for what God is doing. Paul sees this as a divine appointment, so he stops this jailer from killing himself. Paul tells him not to harm himself. He says, the prisoners are all here. Here's the question. How did Paul know? How did Paul know that all the prisoners were still there? I would submit to you because they were all there in his cell with him. What would make prisoners do that? I'll tell you what I think. I think the songs that they were singing and the prayers they were giving were pretty powerful. Paul has a gospel opportunity. But Paul would not have this gospel opportunity if he had let bitterness and anger and hatred rule his heart. This is a man who put him in the stocks. And Paul could have said, whatever he gets, he deserves. That would have been true. But lest we forget that we all deserve the same or worse. Paul let go of this bitterness, let go of his anger, let go of his hate. I've heard frequently bitterness whispers to us that our poor treatment of others is going to hurt them and bring us satisfaction. Isn't that what bitterness says? If you just treat them like dirt, you're going to feel better about yourself. It doesn't really work. And I heard this said, in reality, bitterness is like drinking poison expecting the other person to get sick. You see, sinful attitudes prevent us from seeing what God is doing. Compassion for the lost is born out of a forgiving heart. Do you remember the the story that Jesus told of the unjust steward? Jesus told the story about this guy who was forgiven a huge debt, I mean an astronomical debt that he could in no way ever repay in his entire life, and that servant goes out and finds another guy who basically owed him a few dollars... And he throws him into prison and says, you're going to stay there until you pay everything. You see, the master then hears about this and the master throws him into outer darkness and he says, look, you're going to stay there. Why? Because he's saying, look, since you've been forgiven, and Jesus says this, if you've been forgiven much, you love much. When we forgive, it activates love in our hearts for others. Because we've been forgiven so much. Who are we to be angry and bitter with somebody else when we've been forgiven for so much? It's like we're saying, well, that's great, God, but, you know, they can't wrong me and get away with it. I mean, do they know who I am? God says, do you know who I am? And I gave my son for you, and I forgave you. Holding on to pain blinds us to God's purpose. He knows what he's doing. Do we believe that? Because if we believe that, then we say in every situation, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to forgive and I'm going to have passion for, uh, compassion for those who need Jesus. So praising God brings freedom and it brings compassion. And so we have to be ready to speak God's praise. Area number two, we must be ready to speak God's purpose. We must be ready to speak God's purpose. Can anyone tell me, uh, the shoe company Nike, what is their motto? Just do it. Just do it. That's what they're all about, right? They they, uh, used to be uh, all about empowering athletes to give peak performance. Okay? Everyone knows their motto. Everyone knows their purpose. The question is this. Are we as familiar with God's purpose? Do we know God's purpose for the lost? Can, can, does it just roll off of our tongue like just do it does for Nike? Are we willing and able to share? See, what is, what is God's purpose for the lost? He says that he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. 
Mark says, Go you therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? That's God's purpose for the lost. Now to know and understand and share God's purpose, there's two basic principles that we need to understand. Principle number one, God's purpose is simple. Look at verse 29. Acts 16, verse 29, Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. This man falls before Paul and Silas. Now, think about this. This is the keeper of the prison. As far as we know, the other prisoners are in the cell too. So when he comes in, when it talks about falling down, it's like he's bowing down to, to before these men and probably all the other prisoners. This takes a lot of humility. And that's good because... When we come to Christ, humility is essential. Why do I say that? Because we, humility says, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no way to do this. I can't do this. And so we come to Christ. Verse 30. Verse 30, And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This, again, this is the one who placed them in the, inner, in the stocks, in the inner prison, and he now leads them back out. And when he has them out, he asks them a question. And the fact that he asks them this particular question, again, reminds us that they have to have been praying and singing some powerful things. And he's asking what action he needs to take to be saved. What he's saying is this, what is necessary for salvation? This is a vital question. In fact, I would argue that this is the vital question. What must I do to be saved? What is necessary for salvation? How are we saved? What he is thinking it, it, when we look at the grammar and the, and the Greek here, it's, he's basically saying what works are required. Okay? What do I have to do? And this is one of those questions that gets people into trouble because there's an assumption. And the assumption is that we have to do a certain set of works in order to be saved. Paul answers this question in the next verse. Look at verse 31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That's it. Paul's answer is very informative. What is required for salvation? Belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is very significant is what he does not say. Okay? He says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul does not say works. That doesn't mean that we don't work. It's just that we work because we're saved, not for our salvation. Okay? Not lordship, he doesn't say you have to make him Lord of your life, though when you truly know Christ, he's going to be Lord of your life. But that's not part of the gospel. That's part of sanctification, not salvation. Okay? He doesn't say baptism, though that is expected, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But it's not necessary for salvation. The man didn't ask, what do I need to do to have a right relationship with God going forward? He says, what do I need to do to be saved from the penalty of sin? And if you want to be saved from the penalty of sin, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to be saved from sin's power over your life, that has to do with lordship, that has to do with service, that has to do with baptism and these other things. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That is the gospel message. Romans 4, 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. This verse tells us that belief is not a work. Okay? Who does not work, but believes. It's not a work. Faith is not a work. We believe. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. By these verses, it is clear that belief is not a work. We are not saved by anything we do. We are saved by faith. And back in Acts 16, 31, Paul says this, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved in your household. Who is he telling him to believe in? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the full name for Jesus, and it depicts his deity, his humanity, and his purpose. In order to save, our faith must be in the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? We can't, have the, we can't be saved by believing in the Jesus of pop culture. 
We can't be saved by believing the Jesus of false religions or in the Jesus of imagination. Our faith must be in the incarnate one, the God-man, born of a virgin, sinless in life and resurrected from death, the one who is the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine. Our faith must be in the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Our faith was, must be in the Jesus of the Bible not in the Jesus of man's imagination. And folks, in our culture, it is not the Jesus of the Bible that people so often talk about. It is some made-up Jesus that doesn't actually exist. I mean, you've got homeboy Jesus, right? You've got uh, uh, all these different... Uh, I mean, one of, you have white Jesus or black Jesus. or He was Jewish, right? We are not free to make Jesus in our image. We are to be conformed to his image. And it is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone that saves us. When Paul mentions that this man's household is saved, so he says, you and your household are going to be saved. He's not saying that if the, if the father believes, if the husband believes, then the rest of the house is automatically saved. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that they're all saved the same way. Okay? Through faith in Jesus Christ, this, uh, and this point is going to be made even more clearly in verse 34, they would all be saved the same way as the Father, uh, the way laid out in this verse. They believe. What does this tell us? The true gospel message is simple. The true gospel message is simple. Believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, and you're saved. If we are going to be committed to preaching, proclaiming the gospel, this is what we proclaim. If we hear a gospel that is more complicated than this, we know that it's a false gospel. If they add anything else, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, by the way, if we hear a, a gospel that leaves Jesus out, it's not a true gospel. There is only one gospel, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that is what Paul declares to this jailer. That's our first principle. God's purpose is simple. Right? It's a simple gospel. In order to speak God's purpose, we must understand principle number two, God's purpose is stated. God's purpose is stated. Look at verse 32. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Question, where do we find the gospel? It's in the Bible, right? It's in his word. This is really, 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 really important. Paul did not go into the city and make up a gospel. He preached what had been revealed to him. And this is something that he addresses in what I believe to be his first epistle, Galatians. Galatians 1, 11 and 12, he says this, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which I preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, look, I'm not giving you man's opinion. I didn't get this from Peter. I didn't get this from the apostles. I didn't get it from anybody else. I got it from Christ. I mean, if anyone's going to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't you think it would be Jesus Christ? I would hope so. He says he pre they preach the word to this man's family. This is the word logos. It means message. They spoke the Lord's message. What is the Lord's message? You know, we have this really cool banner over here that has this message. This message is, sin entered in the Garden of Eden. But then, someone was born to deal with that problem of sin. And that someone lived a perfect sinless life. And he died on a cross for all of us. But he didn't just stay dead. He rose again, and he is in heaven one day to return and call us home to be with him. What is the gospel? The gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is not be good and do good, and you got a good chance. John writes in 1 John, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved. So Paul and Silas preached the gospel to everyone in the house. Right? Verse 33. And he took them the same hour, so uh, he is the jailer, the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. 
So the jailer takes him to his house to care for them. I don't think this was his typical behavior towards uh, prisoners. His family and all of them as believers are baptized. Now, this is really important. They are baptized because they have believed. Right? Baptism in the early church was immediate more often than not. Uh, they, you see it all through Acts. When they got saved, they almost immediately get baptized because it signified a change in identity and it served as a public announcement that their faith was separated from any other previous faith. This is how essential they believed baptism was. They believe and immediately they are baptized. Now twice in this chapter, we're told that everyone in, the, in a household is baptized. Now, this has led some to claim that what we see is infant baptism. However, verse 34 rules that out. Because verse 34 states that they all believed. Infants cannot believe. Okay? Alberto Valdez made a great point about this in his commentary um, when he was actually commenting on Peter's message in Acts chapter 2. And he says, The qualification those who gladly receive his word rules out infant baptism. Infants, if present, would not have the ability to reason and respond to Peter's persuasive message. So, the biblical accounts of baptism are always be believers. Infants cannot believe, therefore infant baptism is not a biblical practice. Now, I want to be really careful to state this, though. It is also not forbidden in Scripture. Okay? We've got to understand this. It, we don't see any instances of it in Scripture, but it is not forbidden in Scripture. And so I can't say that to baptize infants is sinful. I can't say it's confusing. Okay? Now, if they're, saying that, if they're trying to say that baptism saves an infant, that I can argue with. Okay? But if they're just saying, I just want to sprinkle some water on my kid's head, I can't give them a biblical argument not to do that. Okay, uh, but if, there's, if, if, if they understand that it's not saving them and it's not making them more likely to be saved, then, then it's not something that I can say you absolutely cannot do. However, I think it would be very confusing and I myself would not participate in the baptism of an infant. Uh, so I hope that's clear. What, what I'm saying is it's not necessarily wrong to baptize infants biblically, but I think it can be very confusing to baptize infants. And we don't have any biblical evidence for any time that that ever happened in Scripture. Okay. So, me being who I am, uh, as you all know, I'm pretty sold on doing things that are in this book. And so, if I don't see it in Scripture, I'm not going to do it. Because right? uh, I think it's very confusing and misleading. Verse 34. Verse 34 says, Now when he had brought them into his house... He set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. The jailer feeds Paul and Silas. I, again, I think it's safe to assume that this is not typical jailer behavior, uh, to bring prisoners home, uh, wash their stripes, and feed them. What has changed? This man, uh, to, to put it uh, in an interesting way, he got Jesus, right? Right? This man got saved and he's transformed, right? Old things are passed away. Old things are become new. He's a different guy. Isn't it so fun to see that happen? I mean, here you see it happen in just a matter of hours. This guy puts them in the stocks in the middle of the prison and then the same guy, after he gets saved, takes them out home, washes their stripes and feeds them. Transformation. Now they rejoice because they have believed. This is so cool. Salvation brings joy. Salvation brings joy. I had the great privilege Thursday night of leading my daughter Abby to Christ. And there was joy. There was joy. On her part, on our part, uh, there was joy. So I'm going to meddle this morning. Is your salvation bringing you joy? I know we all would say it should, but is it? Is it bringing you joy? I am so tired of seeing people say, well, I love Jesus. Do you? The joy of the Lord is your strength. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all the rest. Joy. There's, when we're saved, we should be like, woohoo! Christians should be the happiest people because we know the future. We don't have to go to a palm reader or a tarot card reader or anything else because we know what's going to happen. We know our Jesus is going to come back. He's going to take us to be with himself. Hallelujah! Where is our joy? We need to have joy. 
This verse makes it clear that they all believed and thus were baptized. They were not baptized for salvation, but because of it. God's purpose for the salvation of the lost is clearly and simply stated within the pages of Scripture. The gospel is defined by God in His Word. See, I don't get to define the gospel. I don't get to tell you that this is John's opinion of what the gospel is. I tell you, this is what God's Word says about what the gospel is. That's it. Like it or not, doesn't matter. That's what God says, and that's what we believe. That is what the gospel is. And one of the problems today is that people confuse the method of salvation with the result of salvation. And they try to merge those together and say, well, you're saved by works. No, no, the works are the result. Well, you're, you're saved by making Jesus Lord of your life. No, that's the result. Well, you're saved by doing good to your fellow man. No, that's the result. <laughs> Salvation is very simple. Sanctification is a little more complicated. <laughs> Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Really short verse. Really hard to do, right? So the gospel is defined by God and His Word. And if, we know, if we're going to proclaim the gospel, we know we have to proclaim what Scripture reveals. And so if you hear a gospel presentation and it doesn't mesh with what's in here, reject it. Don't, don't fiddle around with it. Don't try to excuse it. Just pfft, reject it. When we have the opportunity, we speak. We speak the simple truth of salvation revealed in God's word. So we have to be ready to speak his praise. We have to be ready to speak his purpose. And finally, area number three, we must be ready to speak God's program. A few years ago, I was able to get a desk in my office. And it's a large desk, so it had a lot of parts. It took quite a while to put together. So I had the directions. And I followed those directions and I got all the pieces and I put it all together and I got it all put together. I got it put in my office and I had pieces left over. And I panicked a little bit. I went through the directions. And I, what, what am I missing here? What am I, I couldn't find it. So I look, about the third time through the directions, I see this little note and it says, extra parts included for replacements. Oh, if I had seen that at the beginning, it would have saved me so much of a headache. Here's the thing. Apparently, this is a new thing. I've had this happen with several um, things that we bought recently. Companies are sending extra parts just in case. Um, they're, they're now designed this way. Here's the thing. You and I have a designer, right, for our lives. And that designer does not believe in extra parts. His program includes all that we are. When he chooses us, he chooses everything about us. And that's what we see in these last few verses. God's program for us includes two elements that we are sometimes tempted to overlook. So two elements. Element number one, God's program includes identity. God's program includes identity. Look at verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officers saying, let those men go. Now, we have no idea what motivated the release. I tend to think that it was always their plan to just hold them overnight. This wasn't uh, supposed to be a long-term imprisonment. So they're going to release them. The point is that the leaders in Philippi, these men who had put Paul and Silas in prison, are now letting them go. Verse 36. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Now, according to verse 27, this is the same man who had just come to Christ. And I get in the text kind of an excitement on his part. Hey, you guys are getting let go. This is awesome, you know? And he tells them to depart in peace. Paul, however, has something else in mind. Verse 37. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now, do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. Two important words here. The word openly, which has the idea of being public, and uncondemned, which literally means untried. What Paul is saying is that there was no legal investigation into the charges brought against Paul and Silas. They simply took the word of these two guys, they beat them, they put them in prison. And Paul now objects to this, these public actions being followed by a secret release. Paul actually upholds the law of the Romans here because what had been done to them was illegal. Okay? 
Paul's demand is for the magistrates. I love this. Remember, these are the leaders in Philippi. Paul says, look, these guys, these leaders need to come down to the jail and they need to get us out. Paul's saying, look, those public actions, the public beating needs to be rectified by them publicly coming and getting us out of jail. Now, what I want to focus on here is that Paul is using his status as a Roman citizen in this situation because he doesn't always do this. He does it here, but he doesn't always do this. When God chose Paul, he chose him as a Roman citizen. And this citizenship helps Paul here, and it's going to help him again later. My point is this. God is going to use us how we are. Paul uses Paul and Silas as Romans. We need to use the resources that God has given us. If you have citizenship in a different country, use that. If you can speak a different language other than English, Use that. If you're a minority, use that. If you have education or a work skill or a musical ability or athleticism or intellect, use it. God chose you with those gifts and talents so that he could use them. Okay? All of these things are part of God's plan and he will use them. Now, just a side note, we're not talking about skills or talents that are, that are related to sinful activity. For example, we're not saying that God wants to use your skills as a safe cracker for Jesus, okay? That's, that's not what we're saying. Well, I'm a really good liar. That's not what we're saying. We're not talking about lying for Jesus, okay? We're talking about gifts, talents, or abilities that are God-honoring, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 17 to 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 17 to 24, has what some view as a very controversial passage because of what Paul tells these believers in Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 7, 17 to 24. If you're using our Pew Bible, it's page 1315. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so ordain, I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while well, circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while well, uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while well, a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while well, a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while well, free is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Now this could be a little bit controversial. He's telling them, look, if, if God called you and you're a slave, don't worry about it. Serve God as a slave. Now if you can be free, then get free. What's he saying? He's saying the position that you're in, the talents that you have, the place that you are, God has all those as part of his plan. Your gifts, your talents, your abilities, use them for Christ. You're a farmer, farm for Christ. You clean toilets, clean them for Christ. You do any of these things, do it for the Lord. What does that look like in today's world? When it comes to businesses, be ethical in your business practices. Right? If you're an employee, be a great employee. Don't steal from your boss. Right? Be, a, be, a, be the best employee he has. Okay? So Paul is saying God has called us with who we are. Huh, imagine that. God will use that. God chose you as a complete person and he wants to use all of you. Will we use our gifts, our talents, and our abilities in the service of our master? Part of God's program was for Paul and Silas to use their identity as Roman citizens to accomplish their mission in Philippi. And as I mentioned, Paul doesn't always use this. God's program for each of our lives includes our identity. And that's the first element. Element number two, God's program includes safety. God's program includes safety. Look at verse 38. Let me get back in Acts. Acts 16, verse 38. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Um, hearing Paul and Silas are Romans puts the fear into these magistrates. And this, I believe, is part of God's purpose. Um, here and we're going to see why in a minute look at verse 39 verse 39 then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city so they do exactly what Paul wanted they come and they get them uh, they ask them to leave not command not demand they ask 
Why does Paul go through all of this? I mean, if Paul had a uh, uh, get out of persecution free card, uh, well, shouldn't he have used it before he got beaten? <laughs> right? Shouldn't he have used it at other points uh, in his ministry? Look at verse 40. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. They go to Lydia's house and they visit the new body of believers in Philippi, and this would send a clear message to the magistrates that those in this fellowship were also Romans. What is he doing? Paul's providing protection. No one is going to want to mess with the friends of the guy that the magistrates just had to apologize to and get out of prison. Make sense? This is a, this is a level of protection for this new church that is being, that being grown here. So the fear of the magistrates would protect the church. But I, I want us to understand this. The safest place for the child of God is right in the center of his will. When we are walking in the spirit, we are safe no matter where he leads. Why? Because safety is about ownership, not circumstance. Safety is about ownership, not circumstance. What do I mean? I mean, you belong to Jesus. That's what makes you safe. You belong to Jesus. That's what makes you safe. We are not safe because we live in America, though I'm very thankful to be here. We're safe because God is our God. Okay? You could be led by the Spirit to a tribe of cannibals and you would be safer than anyone in the U.S. because that is where God has placed you. We've been brought, bought with a price. We're called by God to fulfill His mission and until His task for us is completed, we are safe. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. We have been called according to God's purpose and grace. And until his purpose is fulfilled, keep walking with Christ. And so, beloved, we serve him with boldness. Why? Because we're safe. We're safe. Until he's done with us. And when he's done with us, we're doubly safe because we get to go be with him. Right? So as we wrap up this chapter, we've learned that God calls us and leads us through closed doors. We've learned that commitment to proclaim Christ relies on our confidence in God. And we've learned that commitment to preach means that we have to open our mouths. Praising God brings freedom and compassion. Therefore, praising God enables us to accomplish our mission. God's purpose is simple and it is stated, therefore, the gospel must be proclaimed with absolute clarity. God's program includes identity and safety, therefore, we serve the Lord with boldness using all that he has given. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these. We live in a blood-bought freedom that gives us compassionate hearts. We proclaim a simple gospel that is an invitation to all. We have been chosen for a task that will be completed. And so may our lives be transformed as we are used to bring transformation to others. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for Paul and Silas and their faithfulness. I thank you for the example that we have here in Scripture of them being willing to be beaten, being willing to go into the stocks, being willing to be humiliated, all so that they would have an opportunity to proclaim Christ. And I pray, Father, that we would be looking for opportunities to give others the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I ask, Father, that you would use us for your purpose, that you would use us for your glory, that we would fall deeper in love with you, that we would grow in our relationship with Christ, and we would come to understand that eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has reserved for those who love him. Father, I ask that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you in your name. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.